Hey, good afternoon, my fine young biology Padawans. Today we will be covering internal anatomy, okay? And what that means is that we'll be covering these three systems up here, the respiratory, the digestive, and the urinary systems. And of those three, we'll spend the most time, of course, on the digestive system. Along the way, I'll say a few quick words about the circulatory system. Uh, I'll touch on the brain briefly. I'll show you a picture of a brain, in fact. Uh, we'll talk about strategies uh, in terms of fecundity, that means reproductive rates in fish. In other words, why do fish have hundreds or perhaps even thousands of offspring, whereas, whereas birds and mammals only have a few kiddos? So there are some strategies there, and you'll, you'll see how that works out in terms of anatomy in a few minutes. And then uh, lastly, at the end of this presentation, I will get into parasitic worms for a few moments there. Why parasitic worms, you might ask? Well, I will tell you why. Because they are cool. Well, hold on. They're cool to talk about, not cool to have, if you know what I'm saying. All right? All right. So here's the next thing I want to say, right? This is, this is important. When I first thought about doing this presentation, I really, really, really wanted to do some dissection videos. I thought it would be just off the hook, man, to like start filming myself dissecting uh, a rat or a pig or even a frog or maybe even all of them and then go through the parts and what they're doing and make it real educational. I thought that'd be just awesome, you know? But then I thought about it, guys, and I was like, man, that might be graphic content for YouTube, you know? And uh, I don't want to get banned from YouTube, so I decided to do the next best thing. And what exactly is the next best thing, you might be asking yourself? I did a drawing. <laughs> you're like, you're like, well, hold on, Bindley. That's not the next best thing. That's lame. Okay, well, it might be lame, but like I just said, I don't want to get banned from YouTube. And also, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's probably the best drawing I've ever done in my whole life. I'm actually really proud of that. So, so don't don't be a hater, right? Don't be a hater, right? Um, <laughs> it's really ironic because my two daughters are like gifted, gifted artists. They can draw anything and paint anything, and I can't even draw stick figures. And then this here is the best thing I've ever drawn in my whole life, and I'm so proud of it. I'm putting it on YouTube. So, so there you go. There's that. So let's move on to a little anatomy here, okay? Uh, in terms of a mammal, okay, whether you are dissecting a rat or a pig or a cat, the parts are, are pretty much all the same. Yes, there are some differences, right? But the structures internally, for the most part, are basically identical. Once you learn the, the anatomy of one mammal, it's, it's pretty consistent the whole way through. In fact, even with other chordates, like, like this amphibian, this frog, right? The parts are pretty similar. Yeah, there's some, there's some differences, but once you start learning the parts, you'll, you'll see a lot of consistent trends. Like for example, you know, a difference, right? One difference that's, that's important. This frog has a three-chambered heart. You and I have four-chambered hearts. Fish have two-chambered hearts, okay? Fish also have gills. And fish breathe through a process called countercurrent circulation. So yes, there are some differences there, but ultimately, once you learn the, the anatomy, there are way more similarities than there are differences. Okay, I, I let's roll through this. Let's do this. So remember, you and I are deuterostomed coelomates. That means we have a mouth. We have an anus and we have a whole series of tubes that kind of connect the whole thing all along the way. So when you get past the mouth, you have your throat. That's called a pharynx or throat, the pharynx or throat. And in the back of your pharynx, you have, you start getting into this trachea. That is your air tube. Uh, sometimes you call it a windpipe. Okay, and the trachea has rings of cartilage and I did my best to draw them there. Guys, those rings of cartilage are like super important. They give it like this. When you go camping and you have a tent, you have to put poles in the tent 
to keep it upright or else it'll fall on you. Well, guess what? That is the exact same thing with the trachea. It has to have these rings of cartilage to make sure it stays open 24 seven. And, and why must it stay open 24 seven? Because you need oxygen. Oh no. Uh, hold on, hold on, come on computer. Where were you? Come on. Hey, there we go. I'm sorry about that. My bad, my bad, my bad. So where was I? Oh yeah, oxygen. So where does this oxygen go? So it goes down the trachea. Now you have this kind of this branch, right? And from that branch, you have the two bronchi. The, each, each bronchus leads to a lung. And at the tips of your lungs, you have these small grape-like clusters called alveoli. Guys, these alveoli are small. Like I said, they're, they're, they, they are there uh, to promote surface area. Surface area, yo, that is like a big, huge theme in biology, okay? Uh, surface area, that's why cells are small, surface area. So these alveoli are small, you got surface area, so you have a whole lot of gas exchange taking place. So in essence, in the alveoli at the tips of these lungs, that is where oxygen enters the bloodstream and that is where CO2 leaves. And that's, all, right, that's gas exchange. So you exhale the CO2, whereas the oxygen is coming in. And of course the oxygen needs to enter the bloodstream because from there it needs to enter each and every one of your cells and my cells uh, so that you have a process called cellular respiration, which as I've taught you uh, throughout the year, in my humble opinion, cellular respiration is the most important known reaction in this universe, okay? Now, oxygen has entered the bloodstream. Of course, you have this wonderful four-chambered heart, which is pumping it along, okay? There you go. Now you have this muscular wall here called a diaphragm. The diaphragm, fellas, is what, is what separates the uh, thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity, all right? So that just about does it for the respiratory system, at least as far as uh, everything I want to cover. Now let's get into the digestive system. So let's go back up here to your pharynx and your throat. Besides the trachea, you have another tube that kind of runs uh, parallel to the trachea. That is the esophagus or your food tube. It is made out of this involuntary smooth muscle tissue and it travels kind of underneath the respiratory system, underneath that big liver, and it pops out kind of connecting there to the stomach. Now, let me stop right there for just a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Liver, see that liver? And I, I drew the liver just as large. When people do their first dissections, they see this big, huge brown organ, and they automatically assume oftentimes that it is the stomach. Well, that's in fact the liver. The liver is like super important. It has a role with filtering out toxins. Uh, many of these toxins are, of course, environmental, like whether they're pesticides or gasoline or whatever, right? Uh, things that can even cause cancer. It's your liver that is routinely removing these toxins as best as it can. Uh, at the same time, you have your own uh, cellular toxins, your own, your own waste products, like ones called bilirubin, just for example. So it's the liver that's constantly breaking down and filtering out toxins, both internal and, and of course, external environmental, right? Uh, so it's the liver that really helps prevent things like cancer. Uh, so take care of your liver, boys. Eat your spinach, okay? And attached to this liver, you have something called the gallbladder. The gallbladder is kind of a green looking sack. And, and it's green because it stores this, uh, this liquid called bile. Bile has a role with, with digesting fat. So, so check this out. I'm gonna be all cochino for a minute. If you've ever had a really, really bad nausea, like you're just throwing up like a bad fountain, just, boom, you're just, just letting, letting loose. You ever get to the point where you have the dry heaves and, and the only thing that comes out is that greenish fluid at the end? That, gentlemen, is bile, okay? So I kind of touched briefly there on some of the accessory digestive organs. Now let's get back to the stomach. So like I said earlier, the esophagus attaches to the stomach. Now, contrary to what you might have thought previously to this little lesson, the stomach doesn't do a whole lot of anything. You can in fact live without your stomach. Now there are some complications there, but yes, you can live without it. The stomach, in other words, is just a food tube. 
Did I say food tube? No, that's your esophagus. What is wrong with me? The stomach is a storage sack for your food. It just stores food, right? There are acids in there, sure. And it's trying to like, you know, turn your food into mush. You know, it starts with your teeth. Your teeth turn food into mush and your stomach makes it mushier, right? Uh, but it doesn't do any of the actual chemical digestion. Chemical digestion does not take place until the food passes by or passes through the stomach and then enters this small intestine. Guys, check this one out. The small intestine, like far and away, straight up, the small, in, the small intestine is the most important organ in the digestive system. You know that stupid saying, you are what you eat? Like, yo, literally, the small intestine is where that happens. You are what you eat. Those little food, mo the food molecules that you chewed up and they got all mushy in your stomach, can you call them chyme? That, those molecules are called chyme. They literally enter your body through the small intestines walls. Okay, so it enters not so much your body, but it enters the bloodstream through the walls of the small intestines. So yeah, that's you know that's where um, digestion really, really has a big, huge uh, uh, focal point there. Okay, now check this one out. Remember earlier when I was saying the alveoli that that's where oxygen enters your body. So in your small intestine, you've got small little little uh, crevices, I guess that's the right word, small little crevices. They're called villi. Villi, alveoli, they're kind of doing the same thing. They're little bumps in the wall of the small intestine that, that give it surface area so it can absorb more food particles, more sugar, more proteins, right? Uh, so it's entering your body. So think about, I'm sorry, I did it again, entering your bloodstream, excuse me. So think about what is entering your bloodstream. You've got oxygen, from the respiratory system, you've got food, sugar, you know, proteins and whatnot from the digestive system. Along the way, you've got hormones, you've got all sorts of things traveling up and down that circulatory system, which of course the catalyst for it all is that heart, which is just kind of pumping everything, just like a river, it's getting pumped along from cell to cell, organ to organ, and so forth and so on, okay? So I'll say something really, really quickly here about that circulatory system, guys. It's like this, that circulatory, the circulatory system is the bridge. Yeah, I said it, it is the bridge that connects really the entire human body. Okay, like I said, it's got the oxygen from one system, food from another system, hormones from another system. Uh, it, it connects everything and then some, okay? All right, so food enters the bloodstream through the small intestine. So now what's going on? As you kind of wrap around, the next thing is that large intestine. So the large intestine is wider than the small intestine, but the small intestine is actually considerably longer, okay? So here's what's going on in the large intestine. First off, the leftover stuff, <laughs> the leftover stuff is getting passed along. And you know what you call that leftover stuff? Feces, or when you were a little kid, poop, all right? That's getting passed along and ultimately it has to go out, you know, through the colon, out the anus, Okay, so when, and I, you notice I just said the word colon. So in class earlier in the year, somebody was asking me about colon polyps. Like if you're, uh, you know, when you're a middle-aged dude, you gotta get checked for colon cancer, right? So this is the system we're talking about, you know, up the anus through the colon, that's the large intestine, okay? Now, here is the other thing the large intestine does. Besides passing along your feces, that is where water gets absorbed, boys. So the food particles got absorbed in the small intestine, water gets absorbed in the large intestine. So what exactly does that mean? I'll, I'll tell you what this means, okay? Imagine if you have an infection, maybe you have a quote unquote stomach virus or you have a, a little bit of food, poison, food poisoning, you had you know, E. coli from bad pizza or whatever, right? When you have these nasty pathogens that have entered your body, they enter your large intestine and they affect its functioning. Right, so when you have a malfunctioning large intestine, you can't absorb water as well as you used to. So what happens to that water? Well, instead of absorbing it into your bloodstream, you pass it along. And what is it called when you are passing along or, or defecating water? You guessed it, homeboy. That's called diarrhea. So that's why, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier in the year. That's why little kids drink things like Pedialyte when they have bad diarrhea, because they're trying to, it, they're trying to rehydrate themselves. They're trying to put some of those electrolytes back into their body. Okay, so check this one out. Are you ready for this one? This is my fun fact of the day, all right? 
here's my fun fact. If somebody has diarrhea or they have an upset stomach or they have a stomach virus, whatever word you want to use, from now on, boys, from now on, you should not call it a stomach virus. You should not call it a stomach flu. You should not say, I have an upset stomach or I have a tummy ache. You know what the correct word is? You should say, I have a large intestine ache. Ah, I did it again. Darn it, darn it, darn it. So there's my fun fact for the day. It's not his stomach ache. The stomach was up here. His stomach, stomach doesn't, do, it doesn't do anything. It's the large intestine that absorbs the water. And if it's malfunctioning, you have diarrhea. Okay, so almost done, man. The water enters the bloodstream through the large intestine. Now it's going through the bloodstream. So you had sugar there. You have oxygen. I mentioned all these things earlier. And then the water and the blood goes to these kidneys, right? And now we get to the urinary system. It goes to the kidneys, so blood goes through one goes through one side of the kidneys, and it comes out the other as your urine, which gets stored in your urinary bladder, and you you urinate that whenever you urinate. There you go. So what exactly is urine? Nothing more than filtered blood. So you can figure out a lot of the same things uh, from blood that you would from urine. Okay, and there you have the internal systems of our human anatomy. Okay, okay. And you'll notice these words are very, very simple. I did not use any complicated vocabulary. My, term, my physiology, what, the, what they're doing, I kept it very simple as well. I just wanted to keep it almost kind of elementary and hit these structures. Now, finally, I said I wanted to touch on uh, the fecundity or the strategies of why fish have so many kids. Well, first off, fish like this yellow perch here, they have very, very small digestive organs. So most of it is designed so they can have, you know, all, the, all these eggs. Those are like thousands and thousands and thousands of eggs, guys. That's a lot of eggs. Okay. Why do we have so many eggs? Uh, well, they don't take care of their young. Birds and mammals do take care of their young. So how many birds and mammals make it to adulthood? You know, a few. How many fish make it to adulthood? A, a few. So it's, it's all about where do you put your energy? Do you put energy into making the babies or taking care of the babies, all right? I told you I'd show you a picture of a brain and we'll talk more about this in class, but a brain is the single most uh, important structure in the known universe, all right? There you go, there's that. And last but certainly not least, I wanted to show this off. This is pretty cool. So two years ago in my uh, dissection lab, I had multiple groups that were just pulling out these uh, nematodes left and right from their yellow perch. So I thought that was remarkable and I wanted to share it with y'all. So I know I've talked a lot. This is darn near 18 minutes, so I'm going to have to stop quickly because I don't want to get past 18 minutes. So until next time, peace out and God bless.